Let's rise up to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again because we have come to your presence. And we want to learn from your word right now. We are praying, O oh Lord, as a result of what you are sharing with us. And what we are learning together. We will never be the same in ministry again in Jesus' name. We we'll pray at this time again, you open our eyes of understanding. And we will drink deep from your well in Jesus' name. That the treasure you have for us as ministers of the gospel will receive of that well of treasure. And our lives and ministries will have greater treasure to give to the people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Please, you can be seated. This time we come in a series of messages to the leadership. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're looking at it from verse 8. Here are the words of Paul the Apostle. And he writes, he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet or fit or suitable to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. In this session we are looking at the word of God on the privilege of serving God. The privilege of serving God. It is a privilege because it's not something we're qualified for. It's a privilege because it is not a right. When we say something is a right, that means it must be given to us. It is mine. It is my right. And you must not deny me of my right. And therefore we want to blow everything down, push everything down, push everybody out of the way. And they will say, let me go, let me have my chance. This is my right. But the ministry is not a right. It is a privilege. And it is not something I can push the other fellow down and say, don't deny me of my right. It is a privilege. And Paul the Apostle brings out the very fact that ministry is a privilege. Serving God is a privilege. In our profession, the position we have is a privilege from the Lord. And so Paul the Apostle speaks about other apostles. And he said, here is what he did. And then when he wanted to introduce himself, he said, last of all. He said, can you imagine this? That something I didn't think will come my way. And something nobody ever thought will come my way. Came to me. Because last of all, I saw the Lord. As one born out of due time. It said as if the time was almost over. Everything was almost accomplished. And the people the Lord wanted to use, He had called them. And when nobody thought any one single person remained to be put into the ministry. Last of all, he called me and I saw him. Then he said in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles of the Lord. And I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. And you wouldn't have thought that a persecutor would become a preacher. You wouldn't have thought that an aggressive person, injurious, will become an apostle of the Lord who also became an intercessor. You wouldn't be thinking that a destroyer will become a deliverer. But, by the grace of God he said, I am who I am. And I am the apostle of the Lord just because this privilege has been accorded unto me. Then he said, the reason I know, and the reason I say, and the reason I affirm, I shouldn't be a preacher, I shouldn't have been a pastor, 
I shouldn't have been an instrument in the hand of God. I shouldn't have been an apostle is because I persecuted the church of the living God. But, it says in verse 10, by the grace of God. Again, that underscores the fact it is not by marriage. It is not by being well qualified. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. What an encouragement. If it wasn't by marriage, it means then you. Even though you think you don't have any marriage, and you think you don't have the qualification, since it is by grace, it is by the shared love and mercy of God, that same love, that same mercy, that same grace, is available for every one of us, and the grace will reach you. Yeah. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And by the grace of God, you will be what you ought to be. And it's grace, and it's love, and it's mercy, which was given to me, bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than the rest of them, and they all, yet not I. You see, every time he talks about himself, and he says, I did this, I searched, I labored, I worked, was very quick to say, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. In First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He is thanking God not just for his salvation, he's thanking God for his selection. He thanks God for his salvation, of course, that is by grace. Then, his selection into the ministry, that he now came to serve the Lord, he says, is by grace also, in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and an injurious, but I obtained mercy. That's again going back to the grace of God. Mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord, which was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then it says, this is a faithful saying. What the of all acceptation that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. He came to save sinners. And of the sinners who have been saved, I am number one. Of the sinners who have been saved, I am the greatest. Of the sinners who have been saved, I am chief. He's not saying, please understand the language. He's not saying, I am at this present time, as an apostle, a great sinner. No. You know what he's talking about? He's saying, Look at this. We are sinners. Many of them, multitudes, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus came to save sinners. He calls us out of the multitude of people that were sinners. And he called that one, come over here, you are saved. Two, come over here, you are saved. Three, come over here, you are saved. And then of all these people that were saved, Look at this. He called me. He pointed at me. He said, come. And then I came. And then he came to save sinners. All those of us who are on this side were saved. All those who are on that side, they are not saved yet. I am saved. They are saved. Look at us now. Of all those who are saved, I am the chief among them. The chief of sinners. The greatest sinner. And yet, he has saved me. Then in verse 16, I'll be each for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. It says, Now God used me as a pattern 
So that all other people who are desiring to serve the Lord, desiring to minister, and desiring to be a mighty instrument in the hand of the Lord, they can look at my example and look at me and say, Pattern, that it is not by marriage, it is by grace and by mercy. And then that same grace will be available to everyone. And the grace is for you today in Jesus' name. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the privilege of service. The privilege of service. Number two, the power for service. The power for service. Number three, the purpose of service. The purpose of service. Number one is the privilege of service. We look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and we're looking at verse 6. All through to verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Reading from verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee. To be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. It brings us to the very fact that we are chosen. One, chosen to salvation. Two, chosen to service. And now in our choice, the Lord is saying, Thou art an holy people, a special people, a peculiar people unto the Lord. Because He has chosen you to this special position. Number seven, the Lord did not set His love upon you. Nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. Telling us it's a privilege, not because you are well qualified, not because you are so great, not because you are so talented, not because you are better than all the other people. A privilege. Never, never forget that. If you are a pastor, when you stand on Sunday and you have that microphone before you and then you are speaking and you look at that congregation as you stand there you understand this is a privilege this is not a right I am not better than all those other people seated there that are speaking to the Lord could have taken any of these tools and raised up children unto Abraham but because of a privilege and because of the mercy and the grace and the love of God, He has chosen me. And when you stand before that mic, then there will be no cause for pride. And you will not be beating down on the people because, after all, you are not better than them. This is a choice by mercy and by grace in your profession. As the Lord is giving you success and progress and you are getting wisdom, maybe you are even getting some awards. Then there is nothing to be proud about. As you look at the rest of the people in that profession, then you understand this is grace. This is mercy. It is not of him that willeth, neither of him that runneth, but of the Lord that showeth mercy. That's what he's telling us here in verse 8. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn unto your fathers, as the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. In chapter 10 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Behold... The heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God. The earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them. Even you above all people as it is this day. Again he's talking about your selection. He's talking about your choice. And he's saying, the Lord had love for you, and then for your father, to pick you out. And now you are a minister. And you can say, praise the Lord, this is who I am today, because of who he is. This is what I do today, because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. 
all by grace, all by mercy. Now he says, therefore, in verse 16, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more steep left. That is, don't get to yourself a kind of ability or a kind of authority or a kind of title that really you don't have. Just say, this is all by grace. And the pride of, look at who I am. And look at the titles I have. It says, purge that out. And cleanse yourself. And sanctify yourself. And circumcise yourself. And be no more proud. And be no more stiff-necked. And be no more uplifted or high-minded. Because all that the Lord has done is by grace. And this grace that's available to us can take us farther than we are now if we realize it's not in our strength that we have got to the place we have got into, but it is only by the mercy and the love and the grace of God. I'm looking at Romans chapter 3 verse 9. Romans chapter 3 verse 9. What then? Are we any better than they? The answer is no. What then? Actually Paul the Apostle was writing about the Jews. When you look at the epistle of Paul to the Romans in chapter 1, it dwelt much on the defiled and dirty lifestyle of the Gentiles. And as he was writing about the Gentiles, the Jewish people were likely to be proud. They were likely to say, those are Gentiles. That's the way they live. We are not like that. We are better than them. And so in chapter 2, it comes to the Jews. It says, are you a Jew? And then you take pride in the fact that you know the law. And then he begins to describe also the lifestyle of the Jewish people. And so both the Gentiles and the Jews came under condemnation. And then he concludes in chapter 3, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. That is whether you are Jew or you are Gentile. Everyone has been concluded on the sin that nobody in the whole world will claim purity by themselves, holiness by themselves, innocence by themselves. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's why he's saying, those of us who are saved now, or those of us who are Jewish people, or those of us that have any privilege above the rest of the people, he says, what then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise. Which still tells us now, whatever we have, whatever we're doing, and whatever exploits must be showing forth in our ministries. It's not because we are better than anybody else. Don't forget this word, privilege. It's a privilege. The privilege of service. Then it says, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Everyone. And if anybody is saved, it's by grace. If anybody is saved, it's because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so it's not because of the work of our hands. It's not because of the great things we have done or the money we have paid or the talent we have exhibited. It's all of grace. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. In Titus chapter 3 verse 5, not by the works of righteousness which we have done. If you have been having the impression that, well, I got saved, everybody knew I would be saved because I was always a good person, comes all that idea. I am now in the service of the Lord. Everybody knew, even by the time I was young, that I will be in the service of the Lord because actually I was very zealous and I was this, I was that. And everybody now have good, good qualities. Cancel that idea. Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. According to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost which is shed on us abundantly. The renewal of the Holy Ghost which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. 
that's being justified by grace always remember not by marriage by grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life I'm asking then this privilege to enjoy the privilege of service to the Lord what do we need what qualifies us if there is anything that qualifies us as we look at the Bible together yes we know it's by grace but we have to be willing because the Lord does not impose ministry on anyone he does not impose service on anyone although it is by grace just like salvation salvation is by grace but God wants to save everybody but everybody is not saved and yes we know it's by grace the other people that were not saved why were they are they not saved because they did not accept the privilege as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of God even those that believed on his name although it is by grace yet we still have to receive we still have to accept the service that we are called to is a privilege and it's by grace and yet when God calls us we still have to accept I about Jonah it was by grace the Lord called him into service arise and go to Nineveh and cry against that great city because their sins have come up before me he did not accept he ran the other direction therefore even though it is by grace even though it is a privilege we still have to do something so that that grace that privilege will be ours i use the word fast f a s t and i say the people that are fast are the people that receive that grace but that's what fast i mean f forgiven a accepted s sage t transformed you see if the lord is going to put us in the ministry and is going to accord us the privilege of having service unto the lord it's not just that well since it's a privilege i can remain the way i am and it doesn't matter who i am after all it's all by grace uh -uh. no you'll be forgiven you will be accepted you will be saved you'll be transformed and it is those people that have those letters of the word fast reaching out in their experience they are the people that the lord says i'm sending you into the ministry i'm telling you that word fast again another way f flee from all sin a abstain from every appearance of evil and then s separate yourself from the dead and the pollutions of the world t take my yoke upon you fast flee abstain separate take my yoke upon you you see although it is by grace and although it is a privilege if we remain for the sinners and we do not flee from the judgment to come and flee all these things but follow after righteousness and follow after charity and follow after holiness how are we going to be used of god and then yes you separate yourself from the things of the world because the bible says love not the world now that the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all the things that are in the world the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life these are not of the father but is of the world but he that abides in the love of god these are the people that will live forever now the word fast f a s t f follow him follow me and i will make you fishers of men and the people that respond to that call of the lord follow me they are the people that eventually he uses a abide in me for as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me you follow you abide and you seek seek ye first the kingdom of god and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you t trust him t you trust him 
You see, the ministry is for the trusted people. The people that follow after Christ, the people that abide in Christ, the people that seek the kingdom of God and the glory of God only, and then they are trusting Him. Those are the people that eventually, they make use of this privilege that the Lord is calling us to fast. F. Faithful. A. Available. S. Steadfast. T. Teachable. As you look at the Word of God and you look at it from Genesis all through to Revelation, and you see the people that God gave the privilege to, and they received, accepted the privilege of serving the Lord, and were reading about their ministry in the Bible, and we discover that they were used mightily of God. Yes, it's a privilege, but that privilege can turn into productivity in your hand as a minister. What we discover about them, they were faithful to him that had called them. And if you will make up your mind, I want my call in this privilege to produce fruit. Then it means I'm going to be faithful, then available, available. You see, there are many people that the Lord called and they were, they were not available. The Lord Jesus Christ told one man, follow me. Oh, and he says, Lord, I'm coming. Let me go forth and bid farewell to the people at home and then I will follow you. He was not available. The Lord called another one and he said, follow me. And the fellow said, I need to go and bury my father. Then I'll come back to you and follow you. He was not available. If we are going to be used of God, we must be faithful. Then A, we must be available as we must be steadfast you stay at it you stick to it you do not give up there will be times of tiredness there will be times of weariness there will be times of persecution there will be times when you are totally discouraged but the fellow that sticks to it and he says I will not leave I will not leave the service of God and you are steadfast and the people who are teachable and the Lord is able to teach you you are Teachable. Those are the people that the Lord will use and the privilege will be transformed into productivity in their lives. Five, the first one, forgiven, accepted, saved, transformed. The second one, flee, abstain, and uh, separate and take his yoke upon you. Three, follow him, abide in him, seek the kingdom and trust him. Four, you are faithful, you are available, you are steadfast, you are teachable. Five, you are focused. Focused. See, what makes many people not to succeed in ministry? Yes, it's a privilege. The Lord has called you. And then after he has called you, you are not focused. You do this today, and before you finish that, you jump on another thing. Before you finish that, you jump on another thing. You know, people like that, they don't succeed in ministry. But the people that say, this one thing I do, I am focused. A man of one goal, a man of one direction, a man of one pursuit, a man of one mind, a man of one ministry. You are focused, a active, active. I've never found a person folding his hands, succeeding in ministry. I've never found a lazy, idle person succeeding in ministry. But a person who is always at it, a person who is always doing something, a person who is active, is selfless, selfless. You are not thinking, what will I gain out of this? What will I get out of this? You just give up yourself in ministry. What a great privilege that as Jesus gave himself for the salvation of the world, you too, you are selfless. And you give yourself for the salvation of the world. And then, T, you are truthful. You are truthful. You see, what makes some people not to succeed in ministry? That although they are focused, although they are active, Although they are selfless and they are very hard working, but you discover that they color things. They exaggerate things. They are not very, very truthful. They are not truthful to the members of their church. Or they are not truthful to their colleagues who are supporting them in ministry. Or maybe they want to collect offering for something. Uh, they know that actually it will cost such and such an amount. But they also think in their mind, I also need money for this and this and this. And I cannot tell these people now everything. If I tell them this, this, and this, that one they will not agree with. This one they will agree with. And therefore, they will make it elastic. 
they will exaggerate it and they'll say what we need for this project is this because they have in mind the extra they can use for their private thing you see you are not truthful and people will soon discover and they begin to tell one another oh but you know he actually what he's saying when he tells you he needs ten he actually needs three because the other seven he wants to use for another purpose truthful if we are going to succeed in ministry we're focused we're active we're selfless we are also truthful fast six eh, you are fruitful the person who is faithful and focused will be fruitful a you are anointed you stay under the anointing because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke and if we're going to make a successful use of the privilege we have we must have the anointing as spirit field and then she traveling in prayer you are an intercessor you are a prayer warrior and you are praying in faith you are telling the lord oh lord do this do this for the glory of your name and for the salvation of humanity you are traveling seven you are fervent f you are attentive you are fervent on the one hand you are attentive on the other if you know some people that are very zealous that means they are fervent but majority of fervent zealous people are never attentive they don't listen to any other person they don't understand that the spirit of god can also talk to my brother there and the spirit of god can speak to my sister there and they don't want to listen to anybody i am so focused and i'm so faithful and i'm so fervent and i'm so fiery that i don't want to listen to anybody but you know if we're going to succeed in ministry we must be attentive here comes jethro and moses was of course focused and moses was faithful and moses was fervent and fiery and then sat down he was counseling the people of israel and jethro said my son-in-law what are you doing oh i'm counseling the people they have a lot of matters to settle and they bring these matters to me and jethro said let me speak to you and take this to the lord but listen to me first and if the lord accepts it and allows you to do it if you do it this way they'll be able to bear the burden with you and moses was attentive he was attentive even though we are fervent we must be attentive at the same time as saint make sure the lord has sent you you remember when there was a battle and then absalom had been killed and Joab needed a young man to give the information to david as Joab was talking to the person that will take the information then another fellow said let me run also he says no you don't have information at this time this is not the time of your ministry there's a person that has been sent and said yes i know all the same let me run as well then okay if you want to run run and actually he could run faster than the other fellow and then he got to david and uh, david said how did it go in the battle and the man said fine how about the young man absalom does he live and then he said king to tell you the truth i don't know you know joab your servant told this fellow to run and then i said i want to run to you and then david said go aside you don't have any message what's the use of your running when you are not sent you must be sent your parent your attentive you are sent and by the grace of god you will be triumphant amen. give me a good amen. amen triumphant you see that's the privilege we have the privilege we have to do the work of the lord and that work of the lord will prosper in our hands amen. the privilege of service number two power for service power for service acts of the apostles chapter one to do this work of the lord effectively we need to be fortified we need to be empowered we need to be equipped we need all the armor of the lord that we're going to use on the battlefield acts chapter 1 verse 8 but he shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you see ye shall receive power then the next word after 
the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, as you look at the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will think they already had all it took. For example, Peter. You know Peter. Peter was a possible person. And Peter was that downright fellow. And Peter was that presumptuous fellow. And Peter was that aggressive man. There are people that equate being aggressive with being powerful. They are different things. There are people that associate human natural courage with power. But they are different. There are people that equate being confrontational with power. But they are different. When Jesus told his own disciples, I will go to the cross and die for the salvation of humanity. On the third day I will rise again. Peter was confrontational. And he held him and said, Lord, that will not happen to you. There are people that have that natural aggressiveness. And they have that natural boldness and courage. And they can confront almost anybody. And then you remember when they wanted to take the Lord Jesus Christ. And they came and they said, and Judas betrayed him. Then Peter drew out the sword and he cut off the ear of uh, the servant of one of the masters that said they should take him. You think that means power. That anybody that has this natural boldness aggressiveness already has the power to do the work of God but no ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you it is the coming of the Holy Ghost upon us that brings the power to do the work of God it's not the natural boldness the natural courage or natural aggressiveness or the natural confrontational attitude we have that makes us to do the work of God it's after the Holy Ghost comes upon you you receive power. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem. And in Judea. And in Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. How does such a power come? Look at Acts chapter 4. It comes by traveling in prayer. Waiting upon the Lord in prayer. And uh, program without prayer. Will not bring power. Preaching without prayer. We will not bring power. And every other thing we do in church. Night vigil without prayer. You know there are people that have night vigil. And all they do, they sing all throughout almost the night vigil. That will not bring power. There are people that gather together. And when they gather together, all they do during that night vigil, they sing, they shout, Hallelujah, 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 21 times. That will not bring power. Is prayer. You open up your heart. And from the very depth of the well of your heart, you're speaking to the Almighty God. And you are telling God, this work cannot be done in the energy of the flesh. We need the power of God. And it is through traveling in prayer, waiting upon God in prayer, and standing there or sitting there or kneeling there at the altar, saying, Lord, you must send down your power. It is that travail in prayer that will bring the power of God. Acts chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 24. And when they had this... When they had had that, they lifted up their voice with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the hidden rage of the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles. And the people of, of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Behold their threatenings. They were threatening them. They said, don't speak in this name anymore. Don't preach the gospel anymore. And don't talk about Christ who died on the cross anymore. Then they prayed and said, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You see what they prayed for? The Jewish leaders were trying to intimidate them. They were trying to threaten them. 
They were trying to make them fearful. And what do you need at the time of intimidation? What do you need at the time of threatening? What do you need at the time when they're trying to pump up fear from you? You need boldness and that's what they prayed for. We pray for what we need so that the gospel will not have any hindrance to its proclamation. And so they said, now grant your servants boldness that they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. They prayed, they were praying to God. They were not praying to man. They were not trying to attract the attention of man in their prayer. You see, when your body is very, very great and deep, when your desire is very, very great and deep, and when the sorrow in your heart, the passion in your soul, and your request is very important to you, very, very deep, you are not conscious of anybody around you. You are not praying so as to attract anybody's attention. You are not praying so as to disturb your neighbor on the other side. And you are not putting your loudspeaker on your church building so that all the people in the neighborhood may know that you are praying. And you are not going to allow them to sleep. You will not do that after all. You are not praying to them. You are praying to the Almighty God. You can confine your prayer to your church building. You can confine your prayer to your room. And if another person is living in the other room adjacent to you, you are not going to wake them up in the night. So they are coming to knock your door saying, we cannot sleep. You are troubling us. You won't do that. But your body, your heart is broken. And then you are sending your save our soul, SOS, message unto the Lord. We need power. We need authority. We need anointing. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost upon our lives. And then it says, when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness verse 33 and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all great grace and great power and great boldness that's what they had. They spoke the word of God with boldness. They had great grace upon them. And they had great power with them. Chapter 6 of Acts verse 8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And Stephen, full of faith and power. You see, when we have faith, we have the power of God. And then it says, he did great wonders, great miracles among the people. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. That's the result of having power. You see, when you speak to the unbelievers, and they cannot shun you up, they cannot tell you up, they cannot say, don't trouble me, leave me alone, I'm busy now. You are troubling what you are this, your gospel preaching. Hell, hell, hell. You know, uh, people are going to be just, leave me alone. I am busy now. I have other things to do. They will pay attention. When the power for service is there, they could not receive the power, the wisdom, the spirit by which he spake in verse 15. And all that such in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of who? The face of an angel. Well, I don't want to disturb any of you, but I'm just, I need to just tell you that you know, it's good to keep ourselves neat. It's good to keep ourselves presentable. But you know, the beauty and the flashy uh, kind of appearance that is generated by cosmetics will not draw anybody to the kingdom of God. If anything, all the people of the world will be thinking about is that uh -uh, uh, these uh, cosmetics and everything looks like she's almost like us, but we still beat her. There is no way you can compete with the people of the world in the fashion of the world. What will attract them is not the beauty of fashion. It's good to be neat. 
you must be presentable and you dress well so they don't look down you and say these uh, Christian people Pentecostal charismatic people it's like they're so heavenly minded they are no earthly good we shouldn't allow them to say that dress well but the power of the gospel lies in the Holy Spirit and we're told concerning Stephen they looked at his face and his dressing did not distract them he did not use any kind of cosmetics that would make the people pay attention only to the cosmetics they couldn't avoid the fact when they saw Stephen the thing that stood out clearly was the presence and the appearance of the Lord the glory of the Lord upon him and then they saw it was like his face was like that of an angel how I pray the Spirit of God will come upon us it's such a measure that even when we're quiet when we're not speaking at all and they look at us they will see the glory of God that's what happened to Charles G. Finney Charles G. Finney was so filled with the Spirit of God that when he went into a particular factory, the factory workers there that had been making fun of him, when they saw him like this, they became agitated. They became troubled and they remembered their sin. And when they remembered their sin, they just knelt down and began to pray. And the director, the manager of that a factory, then uh, closed the factory and said, Looks like everybody wants to pray. Everybody come together. And they began to pray. I pray that kind of revival will come. <laughs> and that's what the Lord has been doing. I miss you. The power of the Lord upon our lives. I said, you should dress well. Don't say, because I said, we need the power of God. Then you don't comb your hair. You don't uh, have a nice appearance, a nice look. Keep your nice look. Look nice. But let the power of God overshadow you. Yeah. And the power of God will work mightily in your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, it's wonderful when the power of God is so mighty that even when you are not talking at all, Yes, the power of God is doing the work in your life. And the power of God will keep on doing that work in Jesus' name. One of the testimonies we had at Ibadan. One of the mothers was concerned for a child. And the child was having a real serious problem. And the people wanted to see me after I ministered to them. And many, many things have happened to them. Miracles. In fact, there's some miracles there that happened. The church just went wild into jubilation because of the magnitude of those miracles. But this woman having this child, having real serious problems, the mother wanted to see me with the child. And then the apostle told them, but look at the multitude and see how the pastor has been ministering for such a long time. You cannot see him now. And so the uh, woman said, I know what to do. At least the pastor will not stay inside that office, uh, you know, for the rest of the day. He must come out because uh, he will not stay there forever. And so she stood uh, where she knew that if I stand there, when he is coming, he will not be looking down. He has to look up. You know, some of these women are so very wise. And some of these women are wiser than those of us. No matter your strategy, they will catch you. And uh, so I was coming. Then she, she told the child, she said, Now I wanted to go and make you see the pastor to pray for you. And you cannot see the pastor. And we cannot take this problem home. Therefore, I will put you on my head so that you will be above everybody else. And when the pastor is coming out, when the pastor is coming out, don't look any other direction. Look at the face of the pastor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so I was coming out and then I looked up. Who did I see? That child. And immediately healing came on that child. And that that is why we are here together to pass that anointing unto you and the anointing and the power will be upon your life in Jesus name power for service and then now we are reading Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 20 now unto him that is able able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or see 
I rejoice with you. God is going to answer your prayer. Everything you are thinking about, the Lord is going to accomplish. Everything you say out and you ask the Lord, the Lord is going to answer. And it will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or see. But listen to this, according to the power that worketh where? In us. According to the power that worketh in us. That power will work in you. You will succeed in ministry. If you just accept the power of the Lord, you allow him to fill you, to saturate you, and to baptize you in the Holy Ghost, your power, the power of the Holy Ghost, will never fail in your life. Point number three, the purpose of service. The purpose of service. The, it's very important to understand the purpose of our calling. The purpose of our service. Somebody asked a question. He said, who is the fanatic? You've heard the word being fanatical. And somebody asked a question. I've been hearing who is the fanatic. Because they say that fellow is fanatical. That fellow is a fanatic. That fellow is a fanatic. But who is the fanatic by the way? And somebody gave the answer. The person who is running. But he doesn't know the destination is running to. And he's using all his energy. He's expending all resources. And he's running and running and sweating. And yet he doesn't have any goal. He doesn't have any purpose. He doesn't have any destination. That's being fanatical. If you're not going to be fanatical, before you run, you sit down. You count the cost. You ask yourself, what's the reason for my running? What's the reason for my calling? What's the purpose for doing what I'm doing? If we're going to actually succeed in ministry, there must be a purpose for our service. And the people that the Lord called before us, He gave them the purpose. When He called Moses, He told him the purpose. You will take the children of Israel out of Egypt and bring them to this mountain to worship me. When he called Joshua, he told him, These people, Moses had let them prosper. You will lead them to the land of promise. When he called David, he said, David, I found you, a man after my own heart to feed my people Israel. When Jesus Christ came, he declared his purpose. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. When he called his own disciples, he gave them the purpose, go into all the world and teach all nations. That's what you have to do. That's the purpose of your calling. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. I have commanded you and lo, I am with you till the end of the world always. Now, the purpose of service. As the Lord has called us, don't let us just stand up and start running in every direction. What am I called to do? What's the purpose of God for my service? What's the plan of God for my ministry? What am I supposed to accomplish? Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. God told Paul the Apostle, I have appeared unto you for this purpose. It's not enough to just say, I am strong. And I am going to make use of my strength. What's the purpose? I have money. And I am going to make use of my money, my resources. What's the purpose? You define the purpose. And God told the Apostle Paul, I have appeared unto you for this purpose. To make thee a minister and a witness. Both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. He told him, I am sending you to the people. Why did God say, delivering you from the people and the Gentiles to whom I now send you? The reason is because of this. When you are sent to go to some place, and the Lord said, I'm giving you the message of mercy, go and give them. 
I'm giving you the message of healing, go and give them. I'm giving you the message of deliverance, go and give them. I'm giving you the message of prosperity, go and give them. Then you think, I have this precious promise and precious fruit. I want to deliver to the people. Then if you get there and there is any problem, you then begin to doubt, did God send me? Because if God sent me with this treasure to deliver unto them, should there be any hindrance? Yes, there will be hindrance because there is a Satan who wants to keep the people in darkness. And he doesn't want a messenger of light, a servant of the Lord, to come to the people and get them out of darkness. Therefore, he will raise up a lot of trouble, a lot of doors, a lot of hindrance. That's why the Lord prepared the heart of Paul. He said, I'm sending you to them. There might be trouble generated by Satan, but I will deliver you. Amen. And as you go, you are ministering. If the Lord has sent you to a particular tribe to preach the word of God to them, there might be some hindrances and opposition. Don't run away because of that opposition. The Lord has sent you there. And the devil knows what success you are going to have there. That's why he's kicking. But in spite of the devil, you will walk on the head of the devil. And then you will succeed in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes uh, you professional people, you are walking in another place. And the stage might send for you. To say that we have heard that you are in another state, but you are an indigent here. And we hear of the good things you are doing over there. Please, in this section of the economy in our state, come and put things right. Come and do this and do this and do that. And by the grace of God, you have to eat. And God just used the government of your state to bring you to the center of God's will for you. And then you come there and you are you're full of ideas. And you're full of possibilities. I put this right. I did it in the other state. I can come and do it in my own state here. And then while you're doing it, then there is opposition. There is difficulty. And meanwhile, in the other place you left, they have told you, well, although your state government needs you now, if there's any challenge and you need to come back, your place is still there. And you can come back anytime. I will give you your seed. And then when you are having difficulty here, you say, I think I better go back where I came from. Because if this is the will of God for me, why should there be any trouble? There's trouble because God knows he sent you there. And Satan knows you are going to succeed. And if you succeed, you are going to make the economy of the state better. And everything will be better. And he doesn't want that. If you leave, you have done what the devil wants you to do. That's what he wanted. He wanted you to leave, but you will not leave. Yeah. You will not fail. You will stay there. And the Lord will deliver you from every problem there in Jesus' name. Yeah. They say, but they want to kill me. Nobody can kill you. Yeah. Until your work on earth is done, nobody can touch your life. Yeah. It tells us in verse 18 to open their eyes. To turn them from the power of darkness to light. This is how to evaluate the purpose of your ministry. Am I doing what the Lord has called me to do? Have I been sidetracked? Am I concentrating on other things that I'm not called to do? What am I called to do? Open their eyes. What am I called to do? Turn them from darkness to light. What am I called to do? Turn them from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And then Paul the Apostle adds this testimony in verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly calling, to the heavenly vision. Persecution, yes, but I was not disobedient. Difficulties, yes, but I was not disobedient. Hindrances, yes, but I was not disobedient. And yet, he was able to have the victory because he remained with it. You will remain. Amen. And this work must prosper in your hand. Amen. Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, verse 7. And God sent me before you. To preserve you a prosperity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. That's the purpose for Joseph. 
uh, think about this uh, if you look up now uh, as you think about the ministry of Joseph in Egypt God gave him wisdom and he interpreted the dream of Pharaoh and as he interpreted the dream of Pharaoh then Pharaoh said this man you'll be the next person to me at your word they will come you know the story and then he became a prime minister and he distributed food to the millions of the Egyptians I'm going to ask you a question now which was the most important ministry of Joseph the millions of people in Egypt that he was able to provide food for and he fed or the 70 uh, descendants and children and grandchildren of Joseph that eventually came to Egypt you know the average person will feel ministering to the whole country like that of Egypt that's the greatest thing that Joseph could have ever done and ministering to the 70 uh, sons and daughters and grandchildren of Joseph only about 70 of them that's a very little thing but please don't forget it's out of the preservation of the descendants of Abraham Abraham Isaac and Jacob of those descendants that Jesus came and it is a fulfillment of the covenant with Abraham. And so the greater part of the ministry of Joseph was the preservation of those few people. Never forget that. Don't evaluate your ministry by the privilege or the opportunity. Look at the multitudes of the Egyptians I am feeding. Were they saved? Were they born again? Did they give their lives to the Lord? Were preachers and prophets raised up out of them? And did the continuation of the covenant of the Lord continue with all those thousands of Egyptians? The answer is no. But among these few of the descendants of Jacob that Joseph said, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your life by a great deliverance that's the real ministry that Joseph knew that's why I'm here that's why I came and what he did with those people that's what brings us to the New Testament that's what brings us to the ministry of Christ that's what brings us to the salvation of the world now define and determine the purpose for which you are called and when that is determined then go to it get at it and concentrate on it and don't allow anything to sway you in Luke chapter 24 Luke chapter 24 I'm reading from verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem that repentance and removal of sin forgiveness of sin cleansing from sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem what's the purpose then number one to evangelize evangelize the purpose of our calling you might be a professional you might be a preacher the purpose of our calling is that we are to evangelize understand as a professional person you are first a Christian and then a professional you are first a representative of Christ in that profession where you are and then a worker or a minister with the stage number one evangelize number two enlighten enlighten open their eyes that they may see who Christ is and what Christ has done and what Christ means to all of us number three edify edify he gave some apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ for the perfecting of the saints edify number four establish establish as you evangelize and newcomers come to the Lord establish them in your church integrate them in your church follow up on them until they establish number five equip them equip them all that the Lord has equipped you with all that the Lord has put upon you pass it on to the rest of the brethren equip them number six encourage them there will be some people in the church that will feel I am not wise, I am not strong, I am not able to do this or that. Encourage them. Number seven, engage them. Get them to service. 
get them involved in the service of the Lord and then you will be fulfilling the purpose for which you are called one the privilege two the power and then number three the purpose and as we work on this thing as we pray on this thing and we pray them in and allow the Lord to work mightily through our lives this work of the Lord will be established in your church Amen. establish in the kingdom we will evangelize this stage yes. and by the grace of God we in the strength of the Lord will turn the state into the hands of the Lord in Jesus name yes. let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord help us Lord help us and the Lord will help us open your mouth and pray be humble before the Lord is a great privilege seek the power and the strength of the Lord and then stick to the purpose for which you are called.